Hey there, Jen here, and I'm here with a very sobering topic. What I'm referring to are the three recent suicides that are related to gun violence in schools, Sandy Hook and Parkland. There were two teenagers who lost their lives in Parkland, and now as uh, Parkland students are doing online on Twitter and such, they're writing 17 plus 2 because 17 students died at Parkland but two more have committed suicide, likely due to survivor's guilt. And the father who died in Sandy Hook, he was the father of Abigail Richmond, and his name was Jeremy Richmond. And he fought for years and years, ever since his daughter died, to get gun reform going, to figure out, based on neuroscience, what makes people violent in the first place. Um, there are no words. This is a very difficult topic, so bear with me, <laughs> you know, it's, I was going to do this video two days ago, but I couldn't seem to get through researching it and reading all the stories. Um, but today I powered through it because I think it's very important for our status quo to do a story on this. <sighs> okay, so first let's talk about the first suicide in this rash of three. And I'll note also that these this rash of suicides came after New Zealand had their own mass shooting where 50 people died in Christchurch. And they immediately passed a sweeping gun bill to ban automatic weapons, semi-automatic weapons. They passed a sweeping gun bill. So the first suicide was Sydney Alo, who was a freshman in college and had just graduated from Parkland, and she lost one of her best friends, Meadow, in the Parkland shooting. This is from the Washington Post. A 19-year-old dies by suicide one year after surviving the Parkland school shooting. Sydney Alo, a survivor of the school shooting in Parkland, Florida, killed herself last weekend, according to family members and friends cited in news reports. Alo was a senior at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School last year when a gunman killed 17 students and school staff. One of her friends, Meadow Polak, was a victim of the shooting. And Meadow's brother actually wrote a message on Twitter about Sydney's death. A beautiful Sydney with such a bright future was taken from us way too soon. It was completely devastating to bury another beautiful young person in Parkland today. Our community is going through tragedy again. Alo died of a gunshot wound to the head. Alo's mother, Kara, told CBS that her daughter was at school the day of the mass shooting, but not in the freshman building where it occurred. She experienced survivor's guilt and had recently received a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Kara said, Sydney struggled to attend college classes because she was afraid of being in a classroom and was often sad recently, but never asked for help before she killed herself. Alo was passionate about cheerleading, yoga, and brightening up the days of others. And there is a GoFundMe page if you would like to support Sydney's family. Her Facebook page has been turned into a memorial far too soon. This young life this young life affected by gun violence. Meadow Polak's father, Andrew, said, killing yourself is not the answer. If anyone feels like they have no one that can understand their pain, if there's any student out there that's having a hard time, please reach out to me on Twitter. I understand you. You aren't alone. So obviously there's a gun debate and the Parkland students organized a March for Our Lives. Uh, and a year later, we're having suicides from the tragedy instead of good sweeping changes like New Zealand had that will make a difference. And that there's an increased risk around survivor's guilt. Uh, this from the chief medical officer at the Judd Foundation, which works to prevent suicide in young adults. And Ryan Petty, whose daughter Elena was killed in the school massacre, told CBS that it breaks my heart that we've lost yet another student from Stoneman Douglas. So this one is 
is very hard. Her, one of her best friends died. She didn't understand why she was still alive and her best friend wasn't. No one could understand that, especially after 17 students had died. It's truly a tragedy in so many different ways, including that, you know, if she'd reached out for help and not to victim blame, but if someone, I don't know, if someone had seen it, if she had told someone, maybe this could have been prevented. Suicide's a very tricky thing. Mental illness is a very tricky thing. And I think unless you've been in their shoes, you can never understand what these students go through. I think uh, in one of the articles that I read, they said they estimate that 200,000 uh, students had been impacted by gun violence in their schools. Um, that's an absurd number. And I believe that's by year. Uh, it may be within a certain span of years, but it's it's a high number in any regard, and it shouldn't be happening. We need to do more as a country, and especially since a lot of these survivors are the ones who are fighting for all of us. They're fighting in Congress. They're pleading with senators. They're pleading with the President of the United States to have any kind of change. So that one of these school shootings won't happen again. They tried with Sandy Hook. They're still trying. Sandy Hook Promise, which I'll go into later on, is still trying. The parents are still trying. The parents uh, whose six and seven year olds were murdered. They're all trying so hard. It's what their lives are dedicated to. And sometimes it gets to be too much. I'm thankful that they did organize some additional therapy for the students in Parkland, and hopefully they're doing the same in Newtown. Um, I believe that they are. Uh, that's accessible to every single student. No one left out at all. And hopefully, you know, everyone's taking a look at their student or family member or friend and making sure they're okay. I know that the parents of Sydney probably blame themselves, and I hope to God that they don't. It's not their fault. It's no one's fault but the shooters. So the next death was also a Parkland student, and uh, they didn't release his name for a little bit, but now we found out his name is Calvin Desir. So let's go into that. This is a CBS News article. Another Parkland shooting survivor dies in a parent suicide, police say. A second student who survived the school shooting in Parkland, Florida last year has died in what appears to be a suicide. It is the second time in one week that a survivor of the shooting died by suicide. Coral Springs Police spokesman Tyler Rake told CBS that the student died in an apparent suicide Saturday night. On Tuesday, they identified him as Calvin Desir, who was a 16-year-old sophomore, meaning he was a freshman in the year the shooting took place. The tragedy that took place at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School is something that we as a community will struggle with for years to come. City of Coral Springs recognizes the anxiety and suffering for students, teachers, and families who have experienced such violence and devastating loss. As a city, we are committed to shining a light on those who suffer in the darkness. Desire's death came the night before the one-year anniversary of the March for Our Lives. A gun control demonstration that was planned by Marjorie Stoneman Douglas students and there were a lot of people who attended that. Uh, the rally in Washington drew hundreds of thousands of participants and inspired similar marches around the world. And David Hogg, who is one of the most prominent Parkland activists and who helped organize the March for Our Lives, tweeted, how many more kids have to be taken from us as a result of suicide for the government slash school district to do anything? Rest in peace, 17 plus two. And again, a lot of these news articles and status coup want you to know that if you are feeling suicidal at all, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-TALK. And it's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and everything is confidential. We don't have as many details on the death of Calvin Desir. He was a young black student who, in the pictures that we've seen, looks happy. 
and looks, you know, like everything's okay. And so it's important to remember that people who are planning suicide might look okay. It's still important to check on people who you know have gone through something tragic. Just imagining this last year, young freshman going through this, Imagine being, uh, you know, I was uh, 13 when I started as a freshman in high school, and uh, most kids are 14, and just going through something so tragic should never happen to young people. It should never happen to anyone, but having young people see their friends murdered by gun is just unbelievably sad and it's no wonder these kids are going through PTSD and such trauma it's no wonder that they break that their mental health so uh, following that a Sandy Hook dad committed suicide and this was a dad who had a foundation named after his daughter Aviel the Aviel Foundation which I'll get more into and he fought for gun control, he, uh, his foundation and um, himself looked into the neuroscience behind violent students, not, not just violent students, excuse me, behind violent people. What causes this in the first place? What makes someone go into an elementary school or a high school or any school and shoot up a bunch of people? How can someone get to that place where they could possibly do such a thing to fellow human beings? I'll never understand it, but Jeremy was working hard at understanding it. And through his work in the Aviel Foundation, they have made progress, and I hope that they will continue to make progress in figuring out why this happens. And also in getting our uh, legislators to make changes immediately, like New Zealand did. So let's get into Jeremy here, another very, very sad story. This is from the Washington Post. Father of Sandy Hook shooting victim found dead in apparent suicide, police say. The father of a first grade girl killed in the 2012 massacre at Sandy Hook, it's hard to believe it's been that long, elementary school was discovered dead in an apparent suicide Monday morning at a town hall in Connecticut. So in just a little bit over one week, three people connected to school shootings died. Authorities said the body of Jeremy Richmond, 49, was found at about 7 a.m. at Edmond Town Hall in Newtown, a Connecticut, excuse me, a Connecticut community that has been scarred by the tragic school shooting that left 20 students and six staff members dead. The victims included Richmond's daughter, six-year-old Aviel Richmond, Richmond, a neuroscientist who founded the Aviel Foundation in his daughter's name, studied the brain and violence. And the foundation had an office at the town hall. The police wouldn't say how he died. And um, the Lieutenant Aaron Bahamond said, We certainly recognize the heartbreak that this is causing. It's a difficult situation that we're all dealing with here, and it's a sad situation. Um, Chris Murphy tweeted about it. My God, this is awful, horrible, devastating news. Jeremy was a good friend and an unceasing advocate for better research into the brain's violence triggers. He was with me in my office two weeks ago, excited as could be about the Aviel Foundation's latest work. Newtown First Selectman Daniel Rosenthal said, there are no words to describe the tragic weight of today's news. He was a husband, he was a father. After Aviel died, uh, he and his wife went on to have two more children. And as a reminder about Sandy Hook, Aviel and 19 of her classmates were killed December 14, 2012, when a gunman opened fire at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown. And ever since then, these parents have been fighting for gun control. They've been fighting so that no one else would have to suffer this. So imagine what it was like when Parkland happened. They must have felt like they failed, although that's the furthest thing from the truth. They did not fail. Um, so I can just imagine Jeremy after seeing the two suicides from the Parkland students. Um, I can see why this, this broke him. He was traumatized. 
He was doing such great, important work, but he was too traumatized. Um, he did say before he died that the pain had never ended for him. Losing Aviel hurt then, and it hurts now. There's no words that really describe the loss and the feeling of emptiness and missing her profoundly that never goes away and is there every waking moment. Again, if you are feeling suicidal or know anyone who is, call 1-800-273-TALK. And next, I want to talk about the Aviel Foundation a little bit. The Aviel Foundation, as I've mentioned, um, worked on studying the brain, neuroscience, to figure out why violence occurs. And this foundation accepts donations and they say, we need your support. We need a paradigm shift in the way society views the health of the brain. The brain is the organ responsible for our memories, feelings, and behaviors. Yet brain science continues to be the least explored of all our sciences. Your engagement and final support can help to make the invisible visible by building bridges between the biochemical and behavioral sciences. Your support will ultimately help us to prevent violence and build compassion. Jeremy G. Richmond, Ph.D., March 3, 1970 to March 25, 2019. We at the Aviel Foundation would like to make a statement on behalf of the Richmond family. Our hearts are shattered and our heads are struggling to comprehend. Jeremy was a champion father, husband, neuroscientist, and for the past seven years, a crusader on a mission to help uncover the neurological underpinnings of violence through the Aviel Foundation he and his wife Jennifer Hensel founded after the death of their daughter Aviel at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Jeremy was deeply devoted to supporting research into brain ab abnormalities that are linked to abnormal behavior and to promote brain health. Tragically, his death speaks to how insidious and formidable a challenge brain health can be and how critical it is for all of us to seek help for ourselves, our loved ones, and anyone who we suspect may be in need. Jeremy's mission will be carried on by the many who love him, including many who share the heartache and trauma that has suffered since December 14, 2012. We are crushed to pieces, but this important work will continue, because as Jeremy would say, we have to. As we did six years ago, and now much due again today, we ask both the media and the public to give the family the privacy anyone would deserve to begin to process this tragic development. Thank you. Again, there are no words. Um, I said it before, I'll say it again. This man fought for all of us. The Parkland students fight for all of us and still nothing happens. I want to talk about the latest gun bills that we have, but first um, let's get to New Zealand because what New Zealand accomplished is phenomenal, especially from an American point of view, because it feels impossible that our country could ever go this route. So here is New Zealand and what they did uh, from the Washington Post. Thousands of New Zealanders joined Muslims in Friday prayers a week after mass shooting. Okay. On Thursday, the government banned military-style weapons and began to rewrite gun laws with support from across the political spectrum and with the backing of many lobbying groups associated with gun use. There is a general recognition that we don't need these military-style weapons in New Zealand, so it's very easy to win cross-party support for this said Mark Mitchell, who was defense minister in the previous center-right government and supports the ban announced Thursday by Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. A buyback program will be launched to take existing weapons out of circulation and gun owners who do not comply will be subject to fines, she said. On the 15th of March, our history changed forever. Now, our laws will too, Ardern said. We are announcing action today on behalf of all New Zealanders to strengthen our gun laws and make our country a safer place. Ardern said the ban covers all military-style semi-automatics, defined as semi-automatic guns capable of being used with detachable magazines that hold more than five rounds, parts and accessories that can be used to convert less powerful guns into military-style weapons are also banned, along with all high-capacity magazines. The Australian man accused of carrying out the March 15th attacks had five guns, 
two of which had been modified into assault rifles, essentially making them military-style weapons, police said. The time for the easy availability of these weapons must end, and today it will, Ardern said at a news conference. Thursday afternoon, using her power to create rules under existing legislation to put the ban in immediate effect. In short, every semi-automatic weapon used in the terrorist attack on Friday will be banned in this country. Ardern said the ban takes effect immediately to prevent the stockpiling of firearms while legislation to make it permanent is being drafted. So, you can see what New Zealand suffered through. 50 people died in the mass shooting there in Christchurch, but they immediately took action. They immediately banned military-style weapons. They said it, it was easy to get bipartisan support. So why can't we get that bipartisan support here in the United States? It doesn't make any sense. Um, the NRA is a powerful lobby, but they are losing their power in my estimation. And hopefully people will start to see the light because this can't continue. The NRA, uh, from what Al Jazeera uncovered, has a playbook of things to say after a mass shooting to kind of assuage people's fears. You know, a guidebook, what to say to the media, what to say to people who challenge the NRA on uh, their rhetoric and their lobbying. Um, I do want to say that there is very slight progress being made. And when I say very slight, I mean very, very slight. So we have Bill HR 8 and Bill HR 1112. And they are past the house. And right now must go through the Senate and then to the president. So here's HR 8. It was sponsored by Mike Thompson of California. Oh boy. Sorry about that. Um, right now it is in the Senate who is reading it through the second time. The bill establishes new background check requirements for firearm transfers between private parties i.e. unlicensed individuals. Specifically, it prohibits a firearm transfer between private parties unless a licensed gun dealer, manufacturer, or importer takes possession, first takes possession of the firearm to conduct a background check. The prohibition does not apply to certain firearm transfers, such as a gift between spouses in good faith. And then we have another bill that is less, um, has less stuff in it let's say, because the House thinks it will be easier, or the Dems in the House think it will be easier to get through in the Senate. So this is H.R. 1112, Enhanced Background Checks Act of 2019. Um, this one, do, do, do. let's open up the text here. They haven't yet done the summary. To amend Chapter 44 of Title 18, United States Code, to strengthen the background check procedures to be followed before a federal firearms licensee may transfer a firearm to a person who is not such a licensee. So this one, as I said, has also passed the House. We have these two gun bills. Uh, meanwhile, in New Zealand, they've already passed and said it takes place immediately, the banning of military style semi-automatic weapons or any military style weapons at all. That's what we should be doing. So why aren't we taking more action? Why do we have to wait? What is going through the heads of the Senate, the president, the NRA, everyone, and whatever her name is, Dana Loesch, Lash, Dana, D Dana Lash, I think it is. <laughs> Who cares anyway? She's a terrible, evil, person. And I don't feel bad saying that because reading her rhetoric, reading what she says about gun control at all, and she even put down the Parkland students for the efforts that they are making. She's a, a bad person. I don't understand how people could be that way. And I'm sorry to keep saying that, but I, I don't. I don't understand a lot of this. Humans are complicated, but how can you kill children? How could you kill anyone, but especially 
how could you kill children? And then after children are killed, how could you not take action to make sure it doesn't happen again? It's despicable. Absolutely everyone should be taking action, pressing their legislator, legislators, um, making it such a thing here in the United States that this never happens again. I have one last article here. The Parkland and Sandy Hook tragedies inflict more than just bullet wounds. The news that two survivors of the school shooting in Parkland, Florida have taken their own lives one year after a normal day turned into a violent massacre is staggering. So too is the news that Jeremy Richmond, father of one of the first graders killed in the 2012 massacre at Sandy Hook Elementary School, died by apparent suicide. We will never know the extent to which the unimaginable, unimaginable trauma of the school shootings contributed to these suicides, but stories such as these remind us that trauma has far-reaching and devastating effects. It reminds us that the victims are not only the deceased, but also the survivors, and not only the deceased and the survivors, but also each member of their families, and not only each member of their families, but also every person who loves each member of their families, and so on. In children, the effects of trauma are magnified. Um, and the more intense a traumatic experience, the more likely the person is to commit suicide, and that's heightened in children. According to an in-depth investigation by the Post, and this is what I was referring to earlier, um, more than 187,000 children have been present at school during a school shooting since 1999. This includes not only mass shootings, but also the far more common targeted individual attacks. Some refer to children who have witnessed school shootings as the silent victims. Their pain can be intense and severe. For every child who takes his or her own life, countless others are suffering. Therapy helps enormously but nothing can take away what has been seen, heard, and lost. And this is why we must focus on prevention. So that means getting therapy, seeking help, calling the suicide prevention hotline. And what this article doesn't say, well, they do say a little bit, to do this, we must find a way to strengthen our challenge to the National Rifle Association's lobby and keep guns out of schools. We must pass common sense gun control laws before the traumatic effects of gun violence on our children ripple any further. And this article is by Dorothy R. Novick. And I skimmed through some of it, but you get the idea. So that's kind of all I'm going to do for today. I'm sorry if this wasn't the best um, video. I, I could barely do it. I could barely stand to do it. Um, there's just nothing to say. There's nothing to say about the two kids and 19 and, and um, probably 16 are still kids. Their brains needed more time. They needed to not experience such trauma. And the father of the six-year-old girl who had gone on to have two more children with his wife, who had fought so hard, and the Parkland students fighting so hard. I'm sorry to get emotional. I just, I have two young children myself, and I live in an area where guns are, you know, considered cool. <laughs> and I don't understand it. And I've said that probably a million times throughout this video. But I don't. So spread the word on the suicide prevention hotline, pay attention to people you know have gone through traumatic experiences and check in on them. And if you have yourself, check in, even if you think you don't need to get therapy, reach out to someone, call the hotline. There's help out there. All right, I'm going to sign off now and hope that we get some common sense gun laws passed and more and that this never happens again. Bye. Hope you enjoyed that last video. Hop on over to statuscoup.com where you can sign up for our email list and become a member for as low as five to ten dollars a month. Membership is how we grow. That's statuscoup.com slash join. And remember, join our email list so we can grow the revolution with you.